time we do want to take just a few moments if you're a first time guest here we are so glad you decided to worship with us tonight and church family let's just take a few moments and greet all of our guests
seated. We have just several announcements this evening. A reminder that we will be having a baby shower this Wednesday night. That's for Brother Sam and Sister Brittany Mon. You don't want to miss it. That's going to be immediately after Wednesday night service. They are registered at Target and Amazon. Also, this Wednesday night, our Next Steps class is starting. This is a four-week class on basic biblical doctrine. It will start at 7.30 in room 103, so as soon as we start here in the sanctuary, that will start. So if you are new to our church, we highly encourage you to come to this class this Wednesday. Also, next Sunday morning, we'll have a wedding shower for Sister Jasmine and Brother Brett Bixman. We are excited about that. <laughs> Sister Jasmine's in here. Why don't you stand up, Sister Jasmine? Come on. We're so happy for them. It's going to be an awesome time next Sunday. They are registered at Amazon, so check out their registry and come ready to party next Sunday morning after service. Also, this Thursday, we are starting our grief share class. We understand how difficult it can be losing a loved one, so we're starting a 12-week free grief share class. That's going to be on Thursdays at 7 p.m. in room 120. If you haven't registered for that already, please go on the Church Center app or our church website and uh, complete the registration so we can have all the material for you. Also, our Greater Things Conference is coming up. I know we've been talking about it a lot, but we're still excited about it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so awesome. Starting out on Friday, January 27th at 7 p.m. with Brother Aaron Bounds, and then also Saturday at 7 p.m. with Brother Matt Tuttle, and then Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Brother Wayne Huntley. Make sure you have your calendar marked out to be here. Start inviting your friends, your family. It's going to be amazing. At this time, if I could have our experienced Bible quizzers to come up, so our Bible quiz team, they had a tournament this week. Not only did they get first place, but they went undefeated. That's what I'm talking about. Brother Nick, Brother Kendall, Brother Riley. If we could get our coaches as well. Let's give this group a hand, pl a hand of applause. Amen. One more time. Let's give it up for them. Starting the year out strong. Guess we can just go all year without a loss. That would be amazing. Great job. We love you guys. All right. At this time, if we could all stand as our ushers come forward. Sorry, just as y'all are sitting down. But as our ushers come forward, there are three ways you can worship in your giving. You can just drop an envelope right there in the offering bag. You can text the number up on the screen or visit our church website at porterapc.org. Let's pray over this offering. Lord, you're so good. Thank you for your many blessings. Lord, you've been so good to us. At this time, we just want to give back to what is yours, Lord. Give back to your kingdom. We pray that you anoint it and multiply it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let's continue to worship with our praise team.
up the name of Jesus. Lift up that never changing name. <laughs> Lift up that never changing name. There's power in your name, Jesus. There's power in your name, Jesus.
many of you believe that tonight? Amen. That's good because we've got some needs. Brother and Sister Green are sick and have been sick, and they need a healing right now. I know she had COVID earlier in the week, but um, they're just didn't, not getting better as quick as we would like. But we are going to pray for them. Believe that God is going to heal them right here, right now, while we're in this service. We had one. We got a prayer call, prayed for today, and I, a young man out of ICU already before this evening service. We're going to continue to believe that God's moving in that. Brother and Sister McSpadden, I know, are needing a touch from God right here, right now, tonight. They are needing that. Amen. Brother Washington, my good, the Washington family needing a touch from God. How many others in this place? Needing a healing, needing God to step in and do something. Amen, amen. Sister Mary Hale, need God to continue to strengthen her. All of these needs. I believe that God is a healer. Well, I've seen it where he, I haven't gotten my healing. I've had it happen with me too. And in spite of that, I believe with all of my heart that God is a healer. I want us to pray for these needs right now. If you have a need that you, it, maybe it hadn't been called out, Brother Barry. Brother Barry's tonight needing healing in his back. And we know he believes in prayer. I'm telling you, keep, keep those hands up right now. If there's somebody, why don't you stand in for them right now? Why don't you call out that name? We can sing about healing. Do we believe it? Come on, right now, can we pray over every single one of these needs, whatever the condition is? Lord Jesus, you know every single one of them. I ask that you would touch Bishop right now, touch Sister Green, bring healing to their bodies, strength to them right now. Ask that you would strengthen them right where they are. Every one of these needs that's been mentioned are all of them that are represented. Every single person in this building, God, every, every name they've spoken out, or maybe it's someone in this building, by your stripes we are healed. We know that you are the great physician. You are the God that healeth us. And Lord, we're asking right now and believing in your name that you will move in every single one of these needs. In Jesus' name, we ask it right now. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. But what if it doesn't happen? You know what needs to happen to us this year? We need to get a good case of it don't matter. Now, some people already got a good case of that, but they got the wrong kind of it doesn't matter. I don't care who preaches it, don't matter. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what happens, I'm going to do what I want to do. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that kind that those three Hebrew boys had when they stood in front of Nebuchadnezzar. And when they, then he said, listen, when I play the instruments, if you don't bow, who is the God that's going to intervene for you? I'm talking about a case of it doesn't matter or it don't matter. Like they had when they looked at him and said, Oh, king, <laughs> our God is able. He put the sun in the sky. He holds the earth on its axis. He tells the lightning where to go. He tells the waves where they can go. He does all... Believe me, King, our God is able. But be it known, O King, even if he does not deliver, it don't matter. It's not going to change our faithfulness. And so you know what? I'm going to pray for a healing, and I'm going to pray for God to do this and to do that. But I got news for the devil, every devil in hell, and every person on earth. It don't matter. My faithfulness is not dependent on my healing. My faithfulness is not dependent on whether he does what I think is right by me or wrong by me or this. The truth is, everything I've got, I, I don't want what I do. Some people are like, well, I don't deserve this. Let me tell you, I don't want what I deserve. What I deserve is hell. I didn't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve love. I don't deserve, I don't want what I deserve. I'm thankful. And I'm so thankful for all that he has done. It doesn't matter what happens. It's not going to change. God, you get everything. Amen. Thank you, praise team. God bless you. You may return to your seats. 
I see the time. I'm mindful of the time. I know we have a lot to do tonight. Boy, what a wonderful, wonderful crowd tonight. Boy, you look great. Why don't you turn to two, three, four people and just tell them, my goodness, so good to see you tonight. You look great tonight. Why don't you turn to somebody and give them the best smile you can? Not because your day went great, but because God loves you and he knows your name. Amen. God is faithful to every guest. We are so honored to have you with us this evening. It is a great privilege that you choose to worship with us this evening. And so we welcome you. Welcome to this incredible church family, to all the home folks. So good to see you. I love you so much. So thankful for you. If you have your Bibles, I want to turn tonight to James chapter 4. And starting at verse 13 and going to verse 17. James chapter 4, starting at verse 13, going to verse 17. Speaking of this wonderful man, James, so good to see Brother Ainsworth made it home. I'll tell you what, got him for vacation, threw a tile and came to church. What a a spokesperson for faithfulness. I tell you, we love him, glad they made it home. And everybody else that made it home from vacation, we missed you. Welcome home. Take another one in 2025. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. James chapter 4 and verse 13. He says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little while or a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good. And doeth it not. To him it is sin. Now I'm going to take a little while this evening on something I've spent quite a deal of time studying out. And I believe we all need to know because I believe it's imperative to our salvation. And I'm going to take a while on the most dangerous sin. The most dangerous sin. How many of you want to know what that is? Many of you probably already know it, the most dangerous sin. But why don't we ask that God would speak to us tonight, that God would speak to our hearts and our minds and just really be very clear with us tonight. Lord Jesus, we need you. We need to hear your voice. We need your word to penetrate through every part of our heart and our mind and our spirit. God, we need it because if your word does not perform its work, if your spirit does not perform its work, then we cannot be changed. And if we cannot be changed, we cannot spend an eternity with you. So, Lord, I ask that you would work on me tonight. God, if nobody else in the building work on this preacher, God, speak to me. Help me, God, to become and to do everything I can to be what you have called me to be. Have your way in this service. Speak to each and every one of us as only you can do in your precious precious name, Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Right here off the bat, the author sets some things in perspective. He immediately tells them, he says, listen, he says, some of you are, are, are busy making plans and talking about what you're going to do and where you're going to invest and where you're, what you're going to do here and what you're going to do there. And immediately we're like, well, 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 why is that a bad thing? I mean, you need to make a plan, right? Consider the ant, thou sluggard. I mean, he works, he prepares. It, we, we, how can that be a bad thing? But that he's not talking about being prepared. He's not saying that's the issue. What he is saying is, Woe to you that are busy making plans for your life and you're busy deciding what you're going to do here and what you're going to do there and this is going to work this way and this is going to work that way and yet in all of the planning and everything that you've decided, he is not a part of it. 
He said, what you ought to say is, this is the plan if God's willing. And if God allows, I'm going to do this. And he, he said, you need to understand, you may not have a tomorrow. This may be, boy, I remember when preachers used to come and they'd preach that stuff. I mean, they tell you, I can remember, boy, we had some too. I'm going to tell you, I try very hard not to be offensive and not to make it hard for people to receive truth. But I'm going to tell you, anybody, you ain't got to call them out. But I mean, I'm, I didn't grow up where everybody cared quite so much. I mean, I, I grew up in church in the days where they'd come stand next to your row, look at you. I mean, everybody in the church knew what, what they were dealing with. Come on. I mean, I was for Facebook. Your business got out in church. And, man, I'm telling you, and I can remember, boy, some of those preachers, they'd be preaching, and, man, they'd, man, they'd be preaching, and they, I'm telling you, I could feel it. I, I could feel the flames of hell. It, it was getting hot. It was getting, I mean, I was lifting my feet up. I mean, they preached it with so much fire and brimstone. I, I could smell it. I like, man, they, I could smell the burning. I, I, it, it's just, I mean, it, it terrified you. I, you may not have ever experienced this, but I've had nights where I couldn't go to bed before I had to find somewhere saying, uh-uh. Uh, this is it. After he, I, I, I've had times where I just knew I, tomorrow's not coming. This is it. This was the last one. Everybody got right right before Y2K. We had 18 gallons of water, 40 gallons of unleaded, and every borrowed generator we could, but we really didn't think we were going to use them because, I mean, uh-uh, it's not going to work. Every system's going to crash, and God's coming back in 2000. That's going to be it. 1988, they wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus or is God is Coming Back in 88. Anybody remember that? Then January the 1st, 1989, rolled around, and so they wrote another one, 89 Reasons Why He's Coming Back in 88. But I'm gonna tell you, all through time, there have been places and people and, and situations and some circumstances that have set up the perfect environment where we felt like this is it. This is the last hurrah. This is the last altar call. But can I tell you a truth? One of them will be the last one. The problem is I don't know which one will be the last one. How do I make sure I'm ready if I don't know which one's the last one? I treat everyone like it's the last one. I had a coach in high school, and he, he, everybody used to always say, practice makes perfect. He said, that's wrong. Perfect practice makes perfect. He said, because however you practice, that's how you perform. And if you practice lazy, then you'll perform lazy. When we used to go and we'd go in these shooting competitions and for archery and all that, he'd say, if you practice bad form, then when it comes down to the line, that bad form will cost you. Perfect practice makes perfect. You want to know how we can make sure that we're ready? Treating every day like this is the last chance I've got to get ready. There are no freebies. Why? Because we don't know. We don't. The Bible says no man knoweth the hour nor the day when the Son of Man cometh. But we do know the season. He said, but there are some things that are going to happen when nation rises against nation. When there's famine and there's pestilence and there's fires and there's floods. And you see all these things happen on every air. He said, look up for your redemption draw. He said, you may not know the day or the time but you can look around and recognize the season and you want to know why so many people are preaching like they are today because they're recognizing I don't know if it's going to be today I don't know that it's going to be tomorrow but we're in the season and man I can remember my I went home and I couldn't go to bed I was like this is it I got to be ready I've had nights where I went and I wanted to sleep in my parents room because I like to start last night together we'll all be leaving tomorrow We'll be gone. Some glad morning's going to be in the morning. I remember, but I, maybe my faith was just weird. I can remember one time I didn't do my homework. I knew he, that man preached something like tomorrow won't come or this or that or the gift of the... I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that was it. It was the last hurrah. It was done. I was like, we ain't even got to work on this. Well, I got my day wrong, which led to a season of frustration and punishment. 
But the fact remains, there is a day coming. This could be the last communion service we're ever in. Oh, we've heard about that before. Yes. I told somebody once, I, I preached it and I thought it would help me and I still missed it. I remember when I could hold the boys one in each hand. And we just walk around, boy, and I'd sit, just walk around the house holding them. I could probably do it now, but I have to go to a hospital the next day. I'll be laying in bed with my back all messed up and everything else. I don't remember the day. You, you know how you can pick your kid up and just kind of put them on the side and just go about your business? And then they transition to where you got to kind of put the whole, and then you transition to just hugging them. You know what I'm talking about? Do any of you remember the last time you picked them up? Well, you know why? Because we didn't know it would be the last time. I wish somebody would have came when I'd have picked them up for the last time. When the last time, Aubrey, I still, now I make myself because I'm like, no, no, I'm going to make sure I, we, we're not done yet. But I wish somebody the last time I'd picked them up and just held them in that rocker and just rock. I wish somebody would have come up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, don't put them down too quick tonight. It's the last time this will happen. Remember this. This is it. This is the last. But there aren't any warnings like that. There are some services where I've been in. And there were some people in their last service. I've watched some of them and I've looked back with joy because in that last time I saw them, their hands were lifted, they were leaping, they were jumping, they were at the altar praying, and oh my goodness, I was so proud. But there have been some others. To be honest, I wish I could have went and stood up next to them and told them, said, hey, I know you've heard a lot of sermons. You've heard a lot of preachers and you've been... You've been through a lot. You've had a lot of altar calls, but there's a car going to cross the line coming your way tomorrow. Ain't nothing you can do about it. It's not your fault, not anything you did wrong. But this is the last one. But we don't get those kind of warnings. And so you know what he said? He said, let me tell you something. He said, when you're making all of your plans about what you're going to do here and what you're going to do there, he said, make sure all of those plans start with saying, if God's willing, if this is what he wants. If this, he said, I want you to get it so wrapped up in your mind that everything depends on him. All of this stuff, shadows and dust. He said, what is your life but a vapor? It's here and it's gone. Everything we give ourselves to, it's here and it's gone. Buy the house, buy the biggest one on the block. When you're gone, those things that you wouldn't part with, that you'd have had a heart attack, you'd have a, you'd come, if you had a chance to come back, you'd die again by a heart attack if you, sell, if you saw what they're going to sell your stuff for in a garage sale. That stuff that you told them is invaluable is going to go for $2.50 in a haul. It meant something to you. It's not going to mean anything. It's gone. That car that you were willing to work overtime and willing to take a chunk of that money out, and it was it, it'll go to somebody else. It'll move on. Someone else will take the insurance. That house that you built just the way you liked it and you loved it, somebody's going to buy it and paint it yellow and black, purple striped because they love bees and this and that. And it's gonna, they're going to tear the carpet that you said could never be replaced. They're going to tear it out. That, that part that you thought, oh, this makes the house. They're going to undo it. They're going to cover it up. That picture that was worth everything to you, they're going to give it to somebody. They're going to leave it outside the throat. Why do you say, I'm saying there's so much of our life that we we make it a priority, and the moment we're gone, it's nothing. And we're not going to stand before God with all of our stuff and everything. I'm not going to have a garage lined up with all the cars. They're not going with me. I'm not going to have all the real estate behind me, and I'm not going to show up with my portfolio, and I'm not going to show up and say, look how much I put aside. 401K did good this year. Stocks at an all-time high. Look at the Bitcoin. No, no. All of that stuff is dust. The only thing I'm going to stand before him with, 
I'm going to stand before him with every prayer that I've prayed, every tear I've cried, every person that I've reached out to, with everything that I did for him. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That day is coming. And in light of all of that, he ended it by saying, Therefore, knowing that your life is but a vapor, knowing it is precious and it is quick and it is like a candle that when you put it out, you see the smoke and that it's gone. He said it's just a vapor. Knowing how quickly it goes to him that knoweth to do good. And doeth it not to him it is sin. What are you saying? He said your life goes by so quickly. That you better realize anything that you know to make right. You better make it right right now. Anything that you know needs to be worked on. It's got to be worked. Why? Because sin is destructive. What's the danger of sin? The danger of sin is that it separates me from his presence. Which is the opposite of heaven. You ever thought about that? I want to spend an eternity with him in heaven in his presence. Yet I refuse to get rid of things in my life that remove his presence from me. It it, it doesn't make sense. I'm trying to serve two masters and the scripture says I can't do it. He says that that's, that's not how that happens. It brings condemnation. It makes it hard. It kills faith. It kills joy. It separates, separates us from one. Everything about sin destroys. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I remember there was one. I had someone came and told me once. He said, uh, I don't understand. He said, look, I know we all sin, right, Pastor? Our, our preacher. I said, yes, sir. He said, why do we make such a big deal about some of these little things? It's not a big deal. And and I've told this story before, and some of you will recognize it immediately. And I knew that his son had struggled with crack cocaine, and, and I knew that he had lost his son, has lost his family, and because of his addiction, they had not had any kind of contact with their grandchildren. I knew that their son uh, uh, slept on the outside many times, wouldn't even have clothes on because he was so messed up in his mind, rotted the teeth out of his head, lost a good job, lost every dime he had, lost his marriage, didn't even, his family, they had no contact. They spent most of their days wondering where they were. And, and I knew this, and knowing this, I asked them, I remember telling him saying how do you feel about cocaine how do you feel about heroin and this man this very distinguished man a very kind man a very loving man and many times a very patient man I saw a whole different man show up his eyes became so angry he took his fist and he said he said I hate it I mean it was a whole different person but you have to understand why he hated it He hated it not because of the essence of what it was. He doesn't walk past that powder and all that stuff and say, oh, I hate that. No, I hate what it does to what I love. He said, I hate it because I saw it separated me from my son. It separated me from my grandchildren. It stole his livelihood. It stole his family. It stole his marriage. It stole everything that was good. I I put all my dreams and my hopes in him. I gave everything for him, and that stole. Stuff, that addiction stole all of it and destroyed everything good. And I hate it. I remember looking at him and telling him, I said, now you understand how God feels about sin. He hates it. Why? Because it destroys us. It removes us from his presence. And he loves us that much. He hates what it does to our families. He hates what it does to our children. He hates what it does to our marriages. He hates what it does to our relationship with him. He hates what it does to the conversation with him. He hates the condemnation that it brings. He hates the distance that it brings between us and him. He hates what it does to what he loves. I said, well, brother, would you be okay if... Somebody just brought a little bit into your home? Oh, boy, he went off on another tour. I said, that's why. There's no such thing as a little sin. We, 
we can go through Scripture and get a lot of different answers. Moses, what's the, what's the most dangerous sin? <laughs> I don't even have to think about that one. Let me tell you what the most dangerous sin is. If I could go and talk to him. He said, I'll tell you what it is. It's rebellion. I spent 40 years in a wilderness. I watched friends die. I watched... I watched kids bury their mom, bury their dad, bury their grandpa, bury their grandma in a place they didn't belong because they could not be led. They were stiff-necked. They could only do it their way. They couldn't, they couldn't bend anything. It was my way or the highway. And they died in a place they didn't belong because of rebellion. Rebellion killed an entire generation. Rebellion killed. And in the end, I rebelled against God, and it cost me the problem. Oh, that would be easy, preacher. The greatest sin, the most dangerous sin in someone's life is rebellion. And then Solomon would probably come up and say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the one. That's not the one. What's the one? Oh, I thought I had it all. I was smart. I was able to do this. I was able to do that. And I had to acquire this, and I had to acquire this. And I wanted every flashy thing and every shiny thing. And I, I wanted every new thing and every experience. I worked harder, and I worked longer so that I could get. I, I wanted the nicest house, the nicest car. And, and one was never enough. Two was not enough. And then I wanted every flashy thing. And then I wanted to look a certain way. Oh, preacher, I'll tell you, it's vanity. That's the one that will get you. I'm the wisest man that's ever lived, and it got me. It's vanity, preacher. That's the most dangerous sin. Vanity. It will get you. You end up finding yourself telling people, oh, look how good much God has blessed me. And those blessings become the very thing that separates you from his presence. It's vanity, preacher. Samson would come up. It's not either of those things. It's a lust. A woman. That's what it did. I, I couldn't control myself. I couldn't keep my eyes and I couldn't keep my thoughts and I couldn't care. That's what it was. It, it, it was that David was probably walked up. Yep, yeah, that's it. It's perversion. That's what got me. It's adultery. It's the, great, it's the greatest sin. It destroyed my kingdom, my family. It was the greatest thing. I was a man after God's own heart. But perversion got me. The greatest sin, the most dangerous sin, preacher, has got to be perversion. Then Saul comes up and says, oh, no, that's not it. I was the first king he ever picked. I was head and shoulders taller than the others. I could have done anything I wanted, and I got lifted up. It's pride. Pride is the most dangerous sin. You can get prideful over, be, over humility. You can live for God so long that you become prideful over how long you've lived for God and the altar no longer does anything for you because of pride. You can be so far separated from your sin that you become prideful over how good you are and you no longer need him the way you used to need him and boom, you're tripped up. He's like, it's pride. Hey, hey, God told me when I was little in my own eyes, he made me king. But when I was lifted up, I lost everything. Preacher, it's pride. Tell the people they've got to watch pride. And then the rich man comes up and he screams from wherever he is and says, no, it's greed. I said I'd build bigger barns and I said I would do this and I said I was, I was just completely caught up in getting more and more and more and more and when my soul was required of me it cost me everything. Tell them not to be greedy. Tell them to learn to be content in whatsoever state they are in. It's greed, preacher. It wasn't matter which one of these. I started looking online, and this group of people said that pride was the greatest sin. These said that envy. Another said blasphemy. All of them. They all had a different opinion. Each one of these men I've just mentioned, they all had a different opinion on what the most dangerous sin was in their life. But let me ask you something. What's the most dangerous thing? If I'm a farmer, why do you, why do you talk about being a farmer? Because that's what the Scripture compares us to. 
If you go to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 through 9, he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever shall a man sow, that he shall also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. He calls us harvesters. We're farmers. We're planting. Every day we're planting. Whether you get up in the morning feeling like planting or not, you get up and you plant. Whether you decide to go to church or you decide to stay home, you planted something. Whether you decide to give in to temptation or whether you resist it, either way, you planted something. Whether you're faithful or you're not, we're planting all the time. Everywhere we go, we're planting. And the things we plant are going to come up in our children's lives and in our futures. Having said all that, let me tell you something. What's the worst? The fire that destroys the crop. The flood that destroys the crop. The drought that destroys the crop. Or the pestilence that destroys the crop. The freeze that destroys the crop. It doesn't matter. It's gone. It could be the drought, it could be the freeze, it could be the flood, it could be the fire, it could be the locust, it could be this, it could be, it doesn't matter. The truth is, whatever kills the crop is a problem. You don't see farmers sitting and comparing, well, the fire was so much worse. No, the flood, no, they both sit there together having lost it all. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7 says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Romans 13 And 11 says, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Pastor, what's the most dangerous sin? The one you let remain. The one we do not confront. The little one we let hang around. Pastor, it's not, I'm not addicted like that. I didn't lose my crops to the fire. What does it matter if you lose them to the flood? The most dangerous sin is the one I continue to make provision for. We tend to overlook our sin through comparison. We look around at someone that's got a sin bigger than ours. And we build everyone else's sin to such a place that ours is so tiny that it can remain. And in doing so, the little, the little sin becomes the monster. Not because it's so much worse than everybody else's, but it because it has found a way to stay. It can be a little gossip. It can be a little hate. It can be a little bitterness. It can be a little pride. It can be a little envy. It may, well, it's not a big deal. No. 
That's what makes it so dangerous. It's found itself a way to stay small enough to stick around. And its ability to outlast the altar call and to make it through the revival and to make it through the preacher's sermon and to make it through the entire church service and go home with us and continue to live in our hearts makes it far more dangerous. Musicians, you can get ready. Get, get ready. Over and over through history, when they've wanted to conquer someone, when there was an individual that had become a problem, they didn't send entire armies after them. Anybody know what they sent? An assassin. Because one thing many times can do what a lot of things can't. There's no way I'm going to fill my life with a bunch of cares of this world and different things and that altar not have a pull for me. But the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. I don't need a lot of things. I just need one thing. And I don't need it to be a big thing. It can be a little thing. Oh, pastor, I don't believe in that. The rich young ruler came up. Master, what must I do to have eternal life? Not what must I do to please you. Not must, what must I do to have a lot of crowns. We're talking about the most basic of necessities. We never talk about that. We always act like, well, look, he, man, he, he did this and he did that and he, he didn't make it to a disciple. That is not what the rich young ruler lost out. He did not lose his tenure as a disciple. He lost heaven. He lost salvation. He did not come up and say, Master, what must I do to be on the list? What must I do to be a disciple? He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to be saved? And he thought he was safe because Jesus started going through it. Go and do all this. Follow this commandment. Honor, honor your father and your mother. Honor this and that. Thou shalt do this and this and do. And boy, he started. He's like, I got that one. Got it. Got it. Got it. He said, oh, I've done all of these things from my youth. And man, he was feeling it. But God don't look at us like everybody else looks at us. Even me as a pastor. Don't live to my standard. Well, that's where pastor's boundary is. That's where we're going to live further. Don't live to here. Live to there. Live to his standard. See, it's easy for me to look and say, you know what? I know there's some things that they haven't surrendered. I know there's some things that haven't. But, man, they're such incredible people, and they're great. Because that it is. Because that's how I, but can I tell you, when God stands before us, he doesn't say, oh, man, look at all the good they're doing. No. His eyes start burning a hole into every part of our soul. And that rich young ruler says, well, I've done this and I've done that. I've, I've obeyed that commandment and that commandment and that commandment. And Jesus starts to scan. He says, hold on. I'm finding something that don't fit. It's in your heart. It's deep in your heart. It's not a big thing. In fact, no one, maybe no, not a lot of people have caused an issue, but, but I found something. Go and sell all that thou hast and give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Mm. Oh, boy, that one hurt. It wasn't a big one. But God found something that wasn't surrendered to him. He didn't find murder. He didn't find addiction. He didn't find adultery. He didn't find any of these awful things. He didn't find out that he'd murdered somebody and he did this. And no. He found something that he wouldn't let go of. And the Bible says, and the man walked away very sorrowful because he had much. That man 
lost his salvation according to Scripture. Why? Because he was asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the thing that cost him eternal life were the things he fell in love with in this life. Demas hath forsaken me. Why? Having loved this present world. The most dad, that, that rich young ruler must have been like so many thinking, I've got it made. Look at all the stuff I'm not doing. And God said, You don't even understand. The most dangerous sin is still in you. Why? Because it's the one you let hang around. It's the one you will not bring to an altar. It's the one that you will not let my blood cover. And it's the one that you will not get out of your life. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Why? Because it's never about the thing. (laughs) The issue is never the issue. I have had meetings And the issues, why people can't move forward or why they can't do anything, the issues range from here to yonder. But in my short 15, 17 years of ministry, I can tell you this. The issue is never the issue. It is always surrender. It has always been, I can't surrender. It doesn't matter what it is. And I would do you a great disservice tonight, a great disservice, if I did not tell you, listen, you may walk around, we may walk around, and it looks like we've got it all together with somebody else. There may be people with, what? maybe I just just don't love people. He said, though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity or love, I become as a tinkling brass, a sounding cymbal. He said, I make a sound, but that's it. There's nothing there to it. Well, man, Pastor, I'm doing pretty good. I just, I got to, somebody did me wrong, and, 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 and I can't let that go. That's all the enemy needs. Just something small enough that we think we can handle it. I'm not going to lay that one on the altar tonight. Why? It's not a big deal. Friend, it just became the biggest deal in your life. The moment you decided, the moment we decided it's not big enough to be a problem, it just became the assassin of your soul with one intention to take you to hell. Even that right there, we're like, oh, come on, you're being... That's our problem. God, help me to see it the way you see it. How am I going to get victory over sin? When I start seeing it the way he sees it. When I start reeling that little bit of junk that I keep, it's not just a little bit. It is slowly working its way in. Because every day that I allow it to remain, I'm saying, I love you. But if you want with me and you want to be in my life, you got to share a space with this. i got two gods now. I got a big God and I got a little one. No, 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 no. If you got a little God in your life besides him, then you've only got one because he said, I am a jealous God and I will not share it. That's the one you want. That one better be the one that can get your family through a situation. Whatever it is that you've chosen to allow to remain in your life, it better be what can hold your family together, your marriage together. Let that be what holds the future of your children and this. You, that thing better get you through judgment because I'm not going to sit on the sideline and share space with that. I will be God over everything or God over nothing. Pastor, you're saying we can never fail. No, we know that we fail. We know that we falter. I'm talking about the things that we choose to allow to remain. Tonight is a night of communion. So many times we find ourselves in situations in life we don't have to be in. But the little things that we allow to remain in our life continue to wreak havoc, continue to keep us separated from Him. 
When's the last time? We sing the song, but singing it and living are two different things. When, the la- when is the last time you found yourself in his presence and just started saying, I surrender all? I surrender all of it. I surrender everything. I mean holding nothing back. Not just the words, but I mean really saying, God, I don't care what it costs. I surrender all. That's why communion is so powerful. That's why it's so powerful. Because it reminds us of what he did for us to help us in making the decision to do what we need to do for him. He could have just said, okay, it's forgiven. It's done. I'm just gonna, but he didn't do it like that. No. He went and he stood before Pilate and they hit him. They punched him. They spit on him. Let me tell you something. You'd have a brand new, many of us would have a brand new sin in our life. Someone spit on us. Like, I got a brand new reason to need an altar. We'll do anything to protect this flesh. No man yet hated his own flesh. That's the problem is we love this flesh. problem is we decide what the flesh can handle not based on a prayer room and based on a prayer but based off of what our mind thinks so we're making spiritual decisions with the flesh so to the flesh and to the flesh reap corruption if you want to know what's good for you you got to get in a prayer room find out what you need to get rid of in a prayer room don't make that decision in your mind the flesh always looks out for the flesh they spit on him they cursed him This ain't somebody like some of us said, well, you know what? I'm not going to do anything about it because, bless God, this is worse than I deserve. No, this is a perfect man that knew no sin, that didn't deserve any of it, and he did not even answer his voice. He didn't speak out against him. They beat him. They whipped him. They spit on him. They, They did all of these things. They stripped him. They humiliated him. He answered them not a word. Why? I believe with all my heart. Is because he said, you know what? There's going to come a day and there's a preacher that's going to tell them, you got to let everything go. And I want them to remember that I didn't waste a single sacrifice in coming for them. I let them do whatever they did. I was humiliated, but I stayed the course because they were worth it. Why? Because they're going to have some decisions to make. And I want them to remember why they're making those decisions. They were worth it for me. Will I be worth it for them? I didn't have to do it this way, but I, 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 I didn't spare any expense. Then they took him to the whipping post. Whoa, 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 you don't have to go to the whipping post. Why are you going to the whipping post? This isn't needed for salvation. I know. But I'm not just going to do the bare minimum. By these stripes, they're going to be healed. This blood that's flowing from me is going to purchase. That, that's what's going to take care of the issues in their life. I want them to know I didn't do the bare minimum for them. I didn't figure out, okay, what's the least I can do? Why? Because one day I want them to look back to this. Every time they take communion, every time they remember it, I want them to remember I am not a God that cut corners with them. I didn't try to find a shortcut. I didn't try to find the area of least resistance. I gave above and beyond. Because the enemy is going to try to tell them to find the path of easiest resistance. And I want them to know I didn't do it for them. And I hope they won't do it for me. And they went and they tied him. After they were done beating him, got him across. Had him walk all the way that down. Blood just raining from his body. Crown of thorns shoved on his head. That didn't have to be a part of it. But he endured the cross. They put him up there and drove nails through his hands and through his feet. Pierced his side with a spear. Why? God, why would you go through all that? You want to know why he endured all of that? The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What was that joy? That joy was you and me. That joy was looking forward knowing somebody is going to remember what I've done for them. And it's going to be what helps them make the decision.
to go beyond anywhere they've ever been. They've lived here all their life on the bare minimum. They've lived all their life. Just this, I think this is pretty good. But they're going to sit there on a Sunday night in January. And all of a sudden they're going to remember what I did for them. And it's going to be everything they need to leave behind where they've spent a lifetime. And to step into a world of surrender and a world of sacrifice. And they're going to give me everything they are. And it's going to be the most joyful thing. And for that reason, I'll take the cross. Would you stand with me? If tonight I begin to ask you, as the servers, as they begin to get ready with the communion, if I asked you right now, What's the most dangerous sin? I would get probably a hundred different answers. Because the thing that's got you twisted may not be what it's got somebody else twisted. And the one that your wife's begging that you'll let go of may not be the one that someone else's husband hopes they let go of. And and your child may be hung up on something far different than someone else's home. And what's going through your home may be different than someone else's home. But can I tell you, They're all dangerous. The one that's the most dangerous is the one that just won't go away. And the one that we continue to make an excuse for. And the one that we quit feeling bad like we used to. Sure, it used to bother us. But I've repented of it so much now that it's just kind of like another member of the family. I don't even repent of it anymore. It doesn't even bother me. I've started to become numb to it. My friend, you were living with a killer. And it's not a physical pain that it's after. It can be, but it's after something far more eternal. You're living with a monster. And you know what I've learned? The biggest monsters don't look like monsters. They look like manageable issues. And because they look so insignificant, we let them stay And it's like a cancer that doesn't get dealt with. It slowly works its way into the heart and into the veins and to the lungs until we're finally, at the last moment, we realize, oh, my goodness. I didn't realize that's what it was. So what do I do, preacher? I'll tell you what we do. We look inside of us, and we don't pick and choose what's little and what's not. We say, God, we do like David. If there's anything in me, take it now if you know what it is you don't have to say if you can say God this is wrong and I need you to help me get over that but God even if there's something I don't realize God if there's anything in me would you help me would you help me I don't know how we're going to do this tonight I'll tell you what I want us to do this year I want us to go beyond anywhere we've ever been but where we are going and where God is calling us to we cannot take the little things that we've refused to lay down there's some things that once and for all have got to be laid down at an altar tonight if we are going to step into what God has for us tell your neighbors there's no such thing as little sin I just wanted you to say it. You need, your flesh needs to hear you say it. The little foxes spoil the vine. It's the little things. You know what I want us to do right now? We're fixing to take this communion. They're going to come up here in just a minute. We're going to hand that out. But before we do, I want there to, we need to have a time of repentance. They're passing that out right now. If you want, very quickly. If you want to take it as a family, that's fine. In fact, you know what, praise singers, it'll be all right. We won't need you tonight. I, I want you to be able to be with your families. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to mess up the plan. But I don't want anybody, that, if you would like to be with your family, please get with your family.
If you still need one, come on, please just raise your hand so they can know who they're missing. is what we're do, about to do right now before you don't have to open it just yet we're fixing to pray why is that such a big deal the scripture says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do, show, you do show the Lord's death till he come but then he didn't stop he said wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. He said many, If in fact, I may need one of those myself. I'd like to join. I may need two. No, I'm truth is we don't do this nearly enough and you're gonna we're gonna do this more this year probably than we've ever done it why because we need the reminder not just at Easter and not just in a new year but we're gonna be doing this more often because that's part of the problem is we only have a few times a year where we really stress the importance of consecration and commitment and this is not a one-time thing communion has become a a, a, a one time a year thing and that's not it was to be it was supposed to be daily it was something we every day we were supposed to put on our mind every day think of him he said but for many there's many that are suffering because they do not recognize the purpose of communion and they do not recognize his body and the purpose of it he said they, they take of the cup and they take of the bread but they do not realize everything that my body was broken for and all that my blood was shed for and they refused to get things out of their life even though my body was broken so that theirs, yours could be made whole and my blood was shed so that you could be washed new and he said there are those that are taking it but they, they refuse to take advantage of the reason my body was broken and my blood was shed he said my body was broken so that you could be made whole and yet we're okay living broken. He said, and my blood was shed so that you could be washed white as snow, yet we continue to be okay being dirty. He said, you're missing the point. Don't miss the point of it. That's what it's about. That's why before we do anything else, I want us to repent, every single one of us. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was one of those issues. Maybe rebellion is something you struggle with. Right now is the time to get it out. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is a perversion, a lust. Maybe it's something like that. Maybe, maybe pride. Maybe pride is what is causing a problem from you. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's vanity. I don't know what it is. But right now is the time for every single one of us to dig inside and to find out, God, is there anything in me that is not yours? And is there anything in me that has not been surrendered to you? And every single one of us, starting from this man right here, I want us right now, I want us to take some time. I'm not, it's not a 30-second time, a 57, 50-second time, a one minute. I want us to turn our minds on him. And I want us to search our hearts, say, God, if there's anything in me, God, if there's anything, that I've let stay God you know what it is if there's anything that I've allowed to remain in my home and God it's tearing down everything good in it if there's anything that's in my life that's working its way into my children God if there's something in me and I don't even realize it and it's starting to tear apart the good in it or God maybe it's something in me that's making me cold and indifferent God 
don't let it stay. God, search out everything in me. Come on, can we pray that? Can we begin to repent together of anything? Maybe you've lived incredible. That's fine. Even Paul said, I die daily. God, search us tonight. God, search our hearts, search our minds. God, if there's anything, you know, if there's anything. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. I don't want anybody worrying about what somebody else is saying next to them. Come on, let's turn this place into a prayer room right now. Come on, dads. Come on, it's our job to lead. It's our job to lead. Our kids ought to hear us pray. Come on, families. search our hearts God I pray over these precious people if there's anything that's wrong if there's any attitude if there's any spirit God if there's anything in us that we that God we have refused to surrender to you take it don't let there be anything in us that is not completely surrendered to you Tear down every lie of the enemy. Tear down everything, God, that we've made, we've been made to feel comfortable with. God, is there if there's something in our heart or our mind? God, I ask that you would bring it to light. Don't let it hide anymore, but bring it to the light that we can know what is trying, God, to pull us from you. Whatever attitude, whatever it may be, whatever little thing it may be, whatever, if it's something. God that is pulling us from you if it's something that you want help us to surrender it to you forgive us forgive us we have fallen so many times but we cannot make it without you forgive us strengthen us and help us help us to please you in how we speak please you in everything we put before our eyes please you in how we God, and how we have conversation to please you in everything that we do, everywhere we go. Every area of our life, let it be pleasing to you, Jesus. We cannot make it without you. What does it matter if we gain the world, if we lose you? Search us and know us. And get everything out of us, God, not just as individuals, but out of this body. Help us to be what you desire for us to be. In Jesus' name.
Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. You can go ahead and take that top part off. says, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me the reason we break this and we take it is because it signifies his body that was broken and given for us. That's why you're not stuck and you're not out of options. It's not hopeless. He didn't leave you that way. He said, and every time you take this, you remember I'd do anything for you. He said, remember my body which was broken for you. We take the bread. And then he said, likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you he said every time you do this I want you to remember you're not who you used to be you not have to be led you don't have to be governed by the things of your past but the blood that was shed for you it washes you out so you're not stuck I don't care what it is you try to get under. I don't know what comes against your mind. I don't know what anxiety and what depression. I don't know who you used to be and what you used to do. I don't know what mistakes in your past the enemy drags up every single day trying to tell you you're not worthy. You don't mean anything. He said, "Uh uh-uh, don't let that tear you away. He said, every time you take this, remember that my blood covered you. And it wasn't for nothing. It was so that you could stand before me and not bound by everything in your life. He said, don't forget it's my blood that was shed for you. He said, and when you take this, I want you to remember it. And so we take the cup. Come on, can we just thank him right now? Come on, we're going to spend a lot of time doing a lot of things. You're probably going to spend an hour at a restaurant, but we can take a little while to say thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for every sacrifice. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for your precious blood that was shed for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Come on, don't stop that. Come on, that he's responding right there. He's responding right there. Go ahead, let that flow all through this place right now. Mamas and daddies, why don't you pray together right now? Why don't you start praying over your children? Pray over your family. Pray over that little boy. Pray over that little girl. Come on. I'm not losing my family. I don't have to because his body that was broken for me, because of his blood that was shed, I don't have to lose my grandbaby. I don't have to lose my boy. I don't have to lose my girl. I don't have to lose my marriage. It doesn't matter what happens in this world. It doesn't matter because of him. Because of him, we are able. Pray over your family right now. Pray over your home. Pray over your marriage. Pray over your children and over their marriage. Pray over your grandchildren. Pray over your parents. Come on. some have already started their fast many are doing it this week some have asked can we do it the next week because a different that's fine that's fine but I'm asking every time everybody if you can't do it this week then do it next week but I want you to take time in prayer and fasting at least three days if you want to do the whole seven that's fine if you have some kind of an issue ailment then it you have to be careful. You can only fast certain things. Yeah, I understand that. I, we're not asking anybody to put themselves in, a, in harm's way. Just put the flesh on notice. Social media would be a great way to start. Um, find something. Find something. I'll tell you what I'm wanting to do this year is every single week, I'm wanting us to have a group of people that are fasting every day of every week. A lot of what we are going to be doing this year is going to be going back to prayer and fasting. The scripture said, this kind cometh not but by prayer and fasting. And that's what we're going to be doing, especially the men. We're going to be meeting once a month, and then many of us are going to be having a, a weekly men's prayer meeting as well. We're, whatever it takes, to, we have to get back to prayer. We cannot make it without prayer. We cannot make it without fasting. How many have already started? How many of you are starting this week or starting tonight? That's fine. How many of you are doing the next week? Okay, I knew many were doing that. That's fine, but I want us to do that. 
If you want to come up here, don't just fast. If you're fasting and not praying, you are just going hungry. It has to be coupled with prayer. Come up here and pray, in the prayer room, wherever you want. You know what I want us to do this year? I want us to go higher. I don't want us to just do what we've always done. I want us to go further. Why? Because there's some things that I want from God, and they're not just normal. I'm wanting him to go to another level in some areas of my life for some things that I'm wanting. And so you know what I'm going to do in response? I'm going higher. I know right here would be okay, but I'm going further. I'm stepping into some places that I've never been. Why? Because I know some things that I'm asking him to do for me and some things I'm asking for my family, for my extended family, and I'm going to do whatever it takes. Amen? Amen. I love you. God bless you. Sister, Sister Ruth, I don't know what you want to say. Oh, whatever I want to sing. Oh, we can sing happy birthday. Anybody have a birthday? No, we can Sister Reap had a birthday. Happy birthday. You know, there used to be a song. I don't know the words, though. You don't have a microphone. I can get you a microphone. Watch. You have a microphone? Did it work now? Sometimes my snapper don't work. I gave my microphone. She's, I, I just need you to sing louder than me. <laughs> what, what's that one? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Do you know that song? A lot of people don't. Oh, hold on, hold on. We, 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 we. That voice deserves a microphone. I don't know all the. Any of y'all know all the words? Well, then we're going to sing a few of the words really well, and then we're going to hum. Well, let's pick another one. Nobody's going to get mad. Their spirits are all right. Now, if I see a lion getting more communion cups, I'm going to know somebody just messed up. They got to go get do it again. Oh, come on, that's a clapping song. Anybody know it? I'm, raise your hand if you know that song. Okay, good. You're all in the choir. Just lift. Come on, let's sing it together. I'm going to a city out some papers right now. I know you're about to leave. I want you to take a few minutes if you can to do this. We did this last year and we have been pushing prayer this year and I want to see if there's any kind of a difference. Now, don't lie to make me feel like we're doing better because then we're even doing worse. Now we're lying to cover up how we're doing bad. At least we were honest about how we were doing. And you may look at it. I'll tell you what this thing is. This is asking questions about prayer. Where do you pray? How often do you pray? It's pretty self-explanatory. The reason I ask this is this is how you take a church's temperature. Prayer is the thermometer of the church. It tells you where we are in our faithfulness. It tells, it tells us where we are in our communion with God, in our time with God, our consecration. Everything is by prayer. And if we're not praying then there's a lot of things that we are living without that 
We have to have spiritually. And so I'm asking if you'll fill these out and then the ushers will be at the door. Please don't put your name. We want this anonymous so that you can be completely honest. We just want to get some feedback on prayer. One of those pages that has two questions, that is for you to take home. That is for something, you can fill that out at home. That's something to to set a goal for yourself that you're wanting to do in reading your scriptures every day and in your daily prayer. That's something for you to set and to take home. But that that first paper is something that allows us to get somewhat of an attitude or, or, or not an attitude, but an understanding of where our church is in prayer. And so if you would please, if you would fill those out and you can turn those in to the ushers on your way out. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Remember, let's stay faithful in our prayer and in our fasting, whether it's this week or next week, or maybe you're just going to be doing a week from here till Jesus, or a day a week from here till Jesus comes. I love you. God bless you. Please finish the uh, f- finish filling those out and turn those in. And then just let somebody know how glad you are they're here. And let's just let God do whatever he wants to do this year. Amen? Hey, oh, good. I can tell. Everybody's busy writing. That's good. Such good students. Amen. God bless you. As soon as we finish turning those in, you are dismissed. I love you. God bless you. God bless you.